Welcome back, Chapter 11, Wenger School. The manager of Beaver, like all other area managers of the corporation and heads of government departments, received word that Wenger finalists were coming round for sightseeing. Wenger was a secondary school established by the Roman Catholics, the only secondary school in the whole country. It was officially called St. Michael's College, but because the college was situated in Wenga Village, where everybody called the college Wenga College, or simply Wenga. Lucky were those who went to Wenga. Parents were proud to have sons in Wenga. Boys and girls were proud to have their brothers or relatives or friends in Wenga. It was a boys boarding school offering a five year secondary education. Not everybody knew that such a school existed in the country. Many people did not even know what a secondary school was. To them, a boy with a standard six certificate was considered very highly educated. The first set of students were to leave Buenga at the end of the year in December. They would take the Cambridge Overseas School Certificate examinations, and whether they passed or failed, they were sure to have top jobs, jobs next to Europeans. Although it was still August, they were taken around the country on a sightseeing trip so that they could see for themselves what job opportunities existed to enable them to make a choice wherever they went. They were highly respected, especially by the local staff, since they were destined to be the future leaders of the country. When Elate came to work and heard all the excitement about a visit by Buenga boys, he did not know what it was all about. I hear that these boys at Buenga know all the book in the world, he heard one worker say. Yes, they are very clever. I am sure they know just as much as the manager. You must be joking. Do you think a black man can know as much as a white man? But I praise the boys. I am sure some of them have medicine. You cannot know such book without medicine. My son must go to Buenga when he grows up. <laughs> you must be joking. Do you know how much money they pay for school fees? Only rich people can send their children to Buenga. Our children are destined to be laborers, not clerks. It was quite true that fees at Boinga were very high up to 12 pounds a year. Only government workers could afford to pay such fees. And they were the only ones who had their children in Boinga. The Roman Catholic mission, however, offered a type of scholarship to some children who passed the entrance exam very well, but whose parents were too poor to sponsor them in Boinga. The holders of these scholarships were expected to be ex exemplary students. They were not expected to break any college rules and regulations. They were also expected to be within the top quarter of their class in all tests and examinations throughout their stay in the college. Also, and this pained the students most, they were supposed to work in the college every Saturday morning for four hours while every other student was free to go out. Elate asked the workers what Buenga was. Was it a factory, an office, a warehouse like this? What was it and where was it? You fool, don't you know the big college at Buenga? When boys finish their senior primary school, the very lucky ones are selected to go to Boenga College. But I thought that after standard six, the next thing was to be a teacher, Elati said. Yes, if you like, you can go and teach. But the few boys who are lucky enough to go to Boenga will end up as senior clerks and even get as far as assistant manager. Anyway, our children were meant to be laborers. This was something new which Elate learned that day. Boenga was only 20 miles away, yet he had never heard of it. 
Of course, he was a mere laborer in the plantations. What had he and Boenga in common? He dismissed the topic from his head and never gave it another thought. The Boenga boys had come and gone and the bustle had died down, but not at Boenga itself. While the students were planning their future, dreaming of jobs, offices, desks, of messengers waiting on them and of the luxury of a three bedroom house, plus a kitchen and store in short, of the whole world bowing at their feet. The college authorities were concerned with other policy problems. Boenga College had started as an experiment which had proved very difficult at the start. Although now there were new buildings with cement walls and floors and zinc roofs, indeed a modern college, life had started at Boenga from very humble beginnings. Five years before, Boenga was only a junior primary school serving the villages around them. Then when the Catholic mission decided to open a college, Boenga was selected as the most suitable site. The primary school was transferred to another village and Boenga College was born. Most of the labor for building was supplied by the young students. First one building was erected, then another, and by the time the first batch of students were leaving, Boenga had become a real college. Now the college authorities were thinking of making two important changes. The first was to supply both lodging and board to the students. So far, they had been responsible for cooking their own food. And this led to untold hardships, especially for the young boys, especially also during the rainy season. The provision of food for students would necessarily mean an increase in fees. The principal was suggesting an increase of six pounds a year. This suggestion received general approval. The second point had to do with the length of schooling in Buenga. So far, it was a five-year college. But now the principal was suggesting that the students should remain in the college for six years. The demands made on our students are so high that I think we should prepare them well here before allowing them to embark on any profession, the principal explained but we are not giving them professional education here. I thought our concern is to teach them academic subjects, Father Martin said. That set in the principle. No, Father Martin, when they leave here, everybody will look to them for leadership. We must do our best to equip them for their future. And that's why next year we should introduce typing and shorthand and bookkeeping in the curriculum. Are you proposing then that we open a seat form? Where shall we have the staff, the equipment, and I am not proposing anything of the sort. I want us to have two classes of entry into the college, form one and form two. We shall set two entrance exams, one for entry into form one, open to standard four boys, and the other for entry into form two, open to standard six boys. What of standard five boys then? Well, they can opt to seat either exam. After a long debate on this, it was agreed that the scheme be given a try. The question of form one boys being too young to fend for themselves was squashed because of the new feeding system. It was, however, agreed that the scheme was only on a trial basis and would be rejected if, if it was found unworkable. Destiny works in mysterious ways. This decision taken in the principal's office at Buenga was to change the lives of many boys, including our hero Mbam. He was now in standard four and there was no doubt that he was a clever boy. Since he had entered standard three, he was always the second in his class. An older boy, in fact, the oldest in the class was always first and Bamu could not beat him, try as hard as he could. This boy, Timothy, knew all the answers of all the problems in the arithmetic textbook. Since the teacher used to set all his questions from the textbook, Timothy would know 
all the answers to the examination questions and even the pages where the questions were taken from. He had also memorized several passages from storybooks like Tom Sawyer, Coral Island, Aladdin and the Lamb. And during examinations, he often quoted these passages, which always impressed the teachers, for he thought they were Timothy's original thoughts. Mbamu had no head for memorizing facts. He could never beat Timothy. One day, just before the end of school, the headmaster walked into Standard 4 classroom and said he had a very important announcement to make. For the first time ever, Standard 4 boys will be allowed to see the entrance exam into Buenga. I have been asked to select the best boys to take the examination. I shall therefore ask your teacher to give me the names of those of you wishing to take the exam. The names, of course, will be screened. There was a commotion in the class as soon as the headmaster had left. Mbamu did not really know what the headmaster had meant. So he turned around and asked his friend, what did the HM mean by entrance exam to Buenga? Is it a job or something? I really don't know. Let's ask the teacher. Excuse me, sir. What is Buenga? If you all keep quiet, I shall explain what it is all about. Buenga is a college, a very big school, where you learn lots of things. Only very select boys go to Buenga, and usually from standard six. But this year, as the headmaster said, they want to take students from standard four. Now, put up your hands, all those who want to go to Buenga. <laughs> Mbamu put up his hands simply because he saw his friends putting up theirs. You heard what the headmaster said. Only the very best will be allowed to sit for the entrance exam. Now, out you go for closing. We shall make the selection tomorrow. There was a hot debate amongst the standard four boys after school on the whole idea of going to Buenga. My father will not be able to pay the fees, said one boy. Oh, I think it's a golden opportunity, remarked another. And I think I shall not miss it. Think of it, to go to Buenga straight from standard four. <laughs> you are forgetting one thing, cutting Timothy. Let's suppose you have been admitted to Buenga from standard four. Should you fail your exams at the end of one year and you are turned out, you will have neither a standard six certificate nor, I am sure, a college certificate. <laughs> My guess is that you will come back here to finish your primary education. Think of the shame in such a demotion. Timothy, as usual, was right. His judgment was always so mature. This set many of the boys thinking hard and some made up their minds there and then to be content with the bird in hand. But not Mbamu. He decided that he would write to his father not only for advice, but for the one shilling entrance fee. Meanwhile, he would indicate his willingness to do the entrance exam. After all, if his father refused, he would simply withdraw his name. A much easier thing to do than to try to have his name included after the final date had expired. The standard five boys were also having a similar debate. The headmaster had told them the option open to them of either sitting for the form one or the form two entrance exams. But if I were you, he had added, I will take the form one entrance exam. That way you will be quite sure of admission. Imagine us sitting with those standard four boys in the same class they argued afterwards amongst themselves. Never. We shall only take the Form 2 exam. How nice it would be to sit in the same class with those proud standard six boys. So they decided unanimously to sit for the Form 2 exam. The following day in Bamu's class, their teacher announced that he had decided that the first five boys, according to the results of the last exam, had been selected to sit for the Buenga entrance exam. The five boys 
were asked to stand up and the rest of the class clap and cheer. The teacher wished them luck and then asked them to sit down. Timothy kept standing, cleared his voice and told the teacher that he would complete his primary education before going to Boenga. He was immediately replaced by the Sith boy. Only one week to go before the entrance exam and Mamu's father had still not replied to his letter. No opinion had been expressed on whether Mbamu should take the entrance exam or not. Neither had he sent Mbamu the entrance fee of one shilling, which Mbamu had asked for. What had happened was that when, El when Elati received the letter from his son, he took it to the warehouse where it was read to him. Mbamu wanted to go to Mbwenga and he was asking for money to see the examinations. Elate laughed loud at what he thought was a big joke. That fancy me sending my child to Buenga. Let him finish his primary school and teach. <laughs> These were the only comments he made. These were the only comments he made. That is true, the others joined in. After spending so much money on his primary education, you should enjoy the fruit of your labor. Let him teach and you will at least be sure of extra money every month. That night, Elati told his wife about their son's letter. And again, they simply laughed at the idea. They dismissed it from their minds and did not even bother to reply to Mbamu's letter. And so on the eve of examination day, Mbamu was still not sure what to do. His mind was in turmoil. Suppose I go there and fail and I am sent back here, he reasoned within himself. I would have lost a year and it would be such a shameful thing to come back to a primary school after having been to college. But the teacher had advised him simply to take the exam by all means. He said he was sure I will do well there. But I have no money anyway. Even if I succeed, who will pay my fees there? My parents are poor. But if I could only get one shilling for the entrance fees, oh, I know what I'll do. Yes, and it worked indeed. He went to his master and told him that he needed a shilling for the entrance exam to Mbwenga. I am expecting money from my father, sir, and I shall repay you as soon as it arrives. Okay, Mbamu, here is a shilling, but remember, I am only lending it to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. One problem was settled, and now he was actually going to take the examinations. The entrance exam did not prove too difficult. The usual type of questions were asked. There was one funny question, though in the English paper of a time Mbamu had never seen before. A sentence had been written without capital letters or punctuation marks. The words were all linked up to form one long and meaningless word. It required that the sentence be written in its original form so that it should make sense. It was like this. If I go, he'll come back, but if I don't, we'll never see him again. After the exams, Mbamu never gave another thought to Boenga. His main concern now was the standard four examinations, which would come in two months' time. If he passed, as he was pretty sure he would, he would enter the senior primary section of the school. Many boys believed that Mbamu had some medicine which helped him to study and pass so well. Some even asked him to show them his medicine. Whenever he laughed at them and told them that he did not believe in medicine for study, they thought he was wicked and just did not want to show them his charm. One morning as Mbamu came to school, he was surprised to see the field so empty. The usual crowd of school children waiting for the morning assembly should be there. But where is everybody? Or perhaps he was late. No, he had left his master's house at the same time, quarter past seven. If really he was late, the pupils should be in their classes. So he ran towards the school building. 
No need to go further. The classes were empty. Then he heard voices coming from the direction of the father's compound, and he ran there. As he turned the corner, he saw all the children gathered around the manager's office. What was wrong? He hurried on. And as he arrived at the manager's office, there was dead silence. He caught a few words of what the manager was saying. He must have been making an announcement. And I am proud of these two boys. Unfortunately, none of the standard five boys made it. But it was a good attempt. And they will have another chance next year. Now, this is very exciting. Two boys from Standard 4 have been selected to enter Form 1. They are. Mbamu now knew that the Buenga results were out, and that was why everybody was so excited. They are George Mbamu and John Ewanga. Congratulations, George and John. I should like to see these boys in my office immediately. Everybody knew Ewanga, and he was immediately carried shoulder high amidst thunderous applause. Not so many boys knew Mbamu because he had always been very quiet. And as he tore his way through the crowd of children, he heard them remarking behind him, There is the boy. That is Mbamu. Oh, he is so small. That boy is very clever. Is that Mbamu? And so on. It was a proud and happy Mbamu that went home, bag and baggage for Christmas holiday. He had passed his standard four exams. He was second again, and he had passed the Buenga entrance exams. As soon as he arrived at Viva, his father was quick to notice that he had brought home all his things. Why have you come home with all your things? Have you been dismissed? His father asked. No, father. On the contrary. I have passed all my exams. I have passed the standard four exams. I was second again. But what is more, I have passed the Buenga exams and I am going to form one. What? His parents exclaimed in sheer bewilderment. Congrats, my son. His mother was first to recover. Oh, my son, you have done very well. Sit down. You must be tired. Well done, Bamu. His father said at last, how long are your holidays? Six weeks, Papa. But Buenga will reopen three weeks after. Oh, they will be the longest holiday I have ever had. Nine weeks in all. The debate which was bound to come started as soon as Mbamu was out of sight. He had gone to the stream to fetch some water. What shall we do, father of Mbamu? Mbamu's mother asked. It is as clear as daylight what we shall do. Mbamu will return to Quito with his things as soon as his holidays are over. He said in a tone which left no room for argument. Oh, but the boy is so happy and wants so much to go to Mbwenga. He'll be so disappointed he is not allowed to go. Do you know the amount they pay for school fees there? It is 12 pounds. Then <laughs> there are clothes to buy and you will need pocket money. We just can't afford the money. Very well. But let's not tell him anything yet. Let's not dampen his holidays. Why deceive the child? The sooner he knows the truth, the better for everybody. Very well. I'll tell him myself as gently as possible. So leave things to me. But she never had the heart to tell Mbamu that he had no hopes of going to Boenga. This was clearly the happiest time in the boy's life, and she, she could not let herself be the bearer of bad news. Mama, I shall be a student soon. Fancy that, a student in Buenga. All my friends will look up to me. Oh, Mama, is it not so nice? Are you not proud of me? Mbamu would prattle on and on. His mother would answer simply, trying to hide her thoughts as much as possible. Yes, my son, we are also proud of you. We are very happy indeed. But she would inwardly say to herself, poor boy, the father is planning to send him back to Quito and he does not know, oh my boy, you will be so disappointed. If only I could help. 
After the excitement of the first few weeks of vacation had worn off, Mbamu asked his father when they would start buying things required for him for college. This is the prospectus, Papa. Two white shirts, two white shorts, one bucket. Wait. <laughs> Where is your mother? Ask her to come here. And Latte was still laughing when his wife came in. What is amusing you, Father Mbamu? She asked. Sit down and listen. Mbamu was reading the things they would require in college. So I wanted you to hear them. Mbamu, read out the prospectus. Mbamu read the prospectus while Elate looked steadily at his wife with a snare in his face. Have you finished? Yes, Papa. No, you haven't. There is the school fees of 12 pounds. Oh, yes, Papa. But it's not 12 pounds. It's 18 pounds this time. What? Both parents scream. Leave us alone, Elati told his son. I want to talk to your mother. Mbamu left them and joined his sister and younger brother outside. You have heard it now. Have you any doubts now what we should do? Elati opened. Look, Father Mbamu, his wife said meekly. Maybe if we ask relatives or friends, they might help us. Let us not give up without trying. Mbamu will never forgive us if we let go this opportunity. Do you think I don't love my son? The trouble is that we haven't got the money. Forget about friends and relatives. Since when have we ever had help from anybody? Even if we manage to get 18 pounds for the first year, what about the second and the third and the fourth till the sea? Have you forgotten what they say at home. When you start to climb a steep hill, do not look up at the top or you will give up. Just look ahead of you and keep moving step by step. Before you know it, you will find yourself at the top. Don't think of the second year and the third year now. Let us only think of how to get him going in the first year. After a lot of argument, it was finally decided that they give it a try. But it was obvious to Elate the whole Mwenga project was doomed to failure. Time only will prove him correct. The next few weeks were devoted to getting the, perspective re re the prospectus ready. They avoided the purchase of new things as much as possible. Only those things that could not be gotten from the house or easily improvised were bought. An old cutlass with no handle was repaired, a new handle fitted. The leaking pail was glued with wax, well washed and sand, well washed with sand and ash. For cutlery, the old fork and a spoon was taken from the house and a new knife had to be bought. The cheapest material were bought for the shirt and shorts. An old salt bag was stuffed with dry grass and converted into a pillow and so on until finally Mbamu had his prospectus ready. The next problem was the school fees. After buying those items of the prospectus that could not be Obtained from the house, Elate was left only with 17 pounds as his total savings. I have some coins here, proceeds from the small vegetable and fruits I sell during payday. Elate's wife produced her cigarette tin safe, and together with her husband, she counted the content. It totaled one pound seventeen shillings and six pence. Elate took one pound to complete the fees and five shillings for pocket money. Then Bamu was sure of at least the first year at Wenga. And that's where we end today. Be sure to join us for chapter twelve. Until next time, I'm Manondo Akonu saying thank you for responding to this summons.